So I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Matt Buckingham, uh, also a Lumberhorn, except in our day we were Lumberjacks, along with Eric, some others. But uh, Matt uh, got both of his degrees, just like me, at Stephen F. Austin State University, Max and Jack. Uh, was uh, in the land trust business for a while before his current job with uh, TechStock. He is not the one to call to get him to stop mowing that day because of the flowers. You have to call the maintenance for that district. <laughs> but he is doing his best as a biologist to save sensitive roadside habitats. We put signs up in a couple of places here in East Texas last several years. And Matt is going to, I'm going to call it what I call it when I asked you. He's basically going to take the piney woods and break it down to the ecosystems. And he will touch on everything you will see on all these trips. Whether you're going to the post oaks, your sand hills with like Suzanne, with me in Upland, where that's also uh, Fox and, and Uplands. And did I forget anything, Matthew? How about it? So, so I guess we need to ask to advance the slide. Oh. Um, <laughs> thanks everybody for, for coming this morning. Um, like Peter said, my name is Matt Buckingham. I'm the biology team lead with TechStot. I work statewide. Um, I'll just put a plug. There is an effort. Uh, TechStot's kind of broken up into these 25 dis different districts statewide, and they're all kind of autonomous, but we also have a central division who I work for. And over the past couple of years, I have been making an effort to target uh, sensitive plant communities, areas where there are rare plants or rare plant communities within our right of way, so that we can develop special management plans to kind of have targeted management activities that help promote whatever that community or whatever the species of interest are. Um, my email is real simple, matt.buckingham at text.gov. I know where a lot of these places are, but it's a huge state. And, I just don't know them all, so I'm always looking if you have a particular area and, you know, this isn't the big blue bonnet patch that's real pretty on the drive or the big patch of Texas paintbrush. This is areas of really species of conservation concern, rare plant communities and things like that that I'm really interested in. But today I'm going to give kind of an overview of some of the ecosystems in East Texas. And um, the way I'm going to present this is it's not a scientific representation of fine level detail of the different communities. Um, I'm going to give kind of a broad scale, give some explanations of some different kind of sub communities within those larger communities. Um, give some resources of where to go look for some of this information. But there have been some um, good scientific efforts. Um, I know Van Clay's done work with like ordination and using statistical approaches to try to characterize plant communities um, on, a, on a finer level that looks at holistically at things like substrates, geology, species composition, and things like that. So definitely look at some of that work. Um, but this is just kind of an over broad overview of the sorts of things that you might see botanizing around the piney woods. And this first map is just kind of that typical so Gould ecoregions of Texas, this is one you hear a lot where you have piney woods, post oak savanna, and things like that. You can see that piney woods section is just kind of this far eastern section of the state. Texas Parks and Wildlife also, this is kind of similar to what EPA uses, their level three ecoregions. These are a little bit more um, finer level detail and they're used in things like the Texas Conservation Action Plans, the Eco Ecological Mapping System of Texas, these different um, programs that Texas Parks and Wildlife kind of works with. I'll touch a little bit on those in a moment here. But one thing to think about, when you look at these maps, these are not hard lines. They're the best effort to sort of capture where the majority of these communities can be found. But at these sort of boundaries between these communities, there'll be fingers of each of the different type of ecoregion that'll kind of penetrate the adjacent ecoregion. Sometimes they'll even jump over multiple ecoregions. So just because you see this sort of general characterization of ecoregions, you can find very similar plant communities between one ecoregion and the next. 
And I like this map because this is showing, um, this is, these are EPA level um, ecoregions of the United States. And when you look at where we're at at East Texas here, you see we're right at the Eastern periphery of a lot of these Eastern ecosystems. So really neat thing to think about is where we're standing right here is more similar in terms of species composition of both plants and animals to places like Virginia or North Carolina than it is to Austin, where some folks might have come from. Um, and you know the reason for that is that the precipitation gradient in Texas is so marked that you very quickly change your plant communities as you move from the piney woods west towards central Texas into west Texas. But in terms of climatic variables and things like that, moving further east, the change is much more gradual. So we're really kind of at this very far western extent of some of these eastern forested communities. I also like to give just kind of an overview of general geology in East Texas. I'm not going to get into too many details, but something to note on this map. And are the colors looking weird for everybody, or is that just my oh, angle? No. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened to the colors, but if anyone can take a look, they can figure that out. Um, but if you look at this map of the geology of Texas, you'll see kind of starting in these the, the middle piney woods here, you have these very narrow bands of ge ge geological formations, and the reason for that is that where we're at in East Texas used to be covered by a shallow inland sea. And that shallow inland sea kind of gradually retreated towards where the Gulf is now. And we, I say gradually in our time scale, but in the terms of geologic time, it was really fairly rapid. And so as that sea sort of regressed to where it is now, it laid down these layers of different types of sediment. And so you have these really narrow bands that oftentimes have different, different chemical compositions and things like that in the substrate. So what you can get is in a really small area, you can go and find different plant communities adapted to those different substrates. It's really kind of a neat part of living here in East Texas. And as you move south, these formations get progressively younger as you move towards the coast, because as that sea kind of retreated, it laid down little layers of sediment. Something else to mention here, and I don't have a particular slide on this, but there's this formation called the Kisatchee Wold that kind of crosses all the way from Louisiana down along the Texas coast, all the way down into South Texas. And this is just this ancient ridge um, that's really not visible to the naked eye, but its effects are really pronounced. And so kind of in East Texas comes through like Northern Jasper County, Newton County. On the Wold is where you see a lot of different rock outcrops little East Texas waterfalls and things like that. North of that wold, you have generally kind of rolling hill topography. South of the Kisatchee Wold, it really kind of, your elevation drops very gradually towards the coast. So you don't get a lot of that hillier topography and stuff like that. And that's why up in kind of the Northern Angelina National Forest, things like that, you see these rolling longleaf pine upland savannas. But as you start moving south into the big thicket, historically, what you would have seen are more longleaf pine, flatwoods, and things like that. Um, one of the neat things about where we are in the West Gulf Coastal Plain here in the Piney Woods is that we've got influences from a lot of different regions. And we have a lot of species because of, you know, you have like the Mississippi River as a barrier. And then this drying as you move further west into, into central Texas is another barrier for a lot of plant species. So we have these species that are endemic just to the West Gulf Coastal Plain, and that's like East Texas, Western Louisiana, little corners of Arkansas and, and, and Oklahoma. And a lot of the species that we find out here are found nowhere else but in the West Gulf Coastal Plain. And here are just some examples. These are maps from the Biota of North America Project, BONAP. It's a very useful site in determining ranges. It, it's a little out of date in terms of some of the taxonomy and distributions, but it's still a really good resource, one that I consult pretty frequently. But here you can see we have species like Simon subciliata, the scarlet um, hedgefly, trillium gracil, Lyotris tenuis, Rebecca scabrifolia. These are species that are found really only in this little region of the country and nowhere else. 
We also have a lot of these eastern peripheral species. So these are things that are common in eastern deciduous forests, Appalachian mountain forests, things like that, that are just reaching the western edge of their range here in East Texas. And this map, these distribution maps kind of show that. You see, we're sitting right at the little corner of where a lot of these species come. And a lot of these species are rather rare um, or uncommon in Texas for a number of reasons. One being that species just tend to be less common on the fringe of their range and in the, the heart of their range. Um, but also there's a lot of these, they're, they're found in particular habitats that have been significantly degraded, things like that. We also have these coastal plain peripherals that make their way into the piney woods. And you especially see these kind of central piney woods south. And you can see they kind of hug. Um, a lot of these would have been species of the vast longleaf pine forest, longleaf pine flatwoods, longleaf pine savannas, and things like that, um, that they kind of follow that general trend from Virginia or North Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina, down through into Eastern Texas. And then there's this kind of interesting disjunction that you see with a number of species where you have populations here in the West Gulf Coastal Plain, and then you have a significant gap that kind of sprays the Mississippi River Delta and things like that, but then picks up again as you get down into like Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, in, into those regions. Um, you know, there's probably opportunities for research here to see how genetically related some of these species really are. But uh, for all intents and purposes, they've been called the same entity for a long time. Um, morphologically, they're similar enough, but that's what we think that they are. Before I get into the communities, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the history of East Texas and where we're at right now. Um, you know, if you were to go back a couple hundred years, you would have seen virgin old growth forests that would, in my opinion, rival pretty much anywhere in the country. Um, by the kind of early to mid 1800s, you started seeing logging pop up as European settlers came in and this was kind of done at smaller scales with more primitive equipment. But certain in inventions kind of towards the later part of the 1800s, like the steam engine and, and more complex timber harvesting equipment led to wide scale exploitation of this resource. And by the late 1800s, early 1900s, East Texas was one of the main timber producing regions of the entire country. There was just this seemingly infinite resource to be utilized. So I just, these are some old historic images pulled from Creative Commons that show you kind of what some of the forest used to look like um, and then the scale of some of this logging that occurred. But all was not lost. There were certain areas where you either had landowners that wanted to preserve what they had. You had areas that were um, too remote or difficult for logging equipment to get into, and those areas were spared. And you have essentially little tiny pockets of old growth forest still in, in East Texas. Then you have other areas that were maybe harvested or cut over once in the 1800s or late early 1900s, and those have essentially returned to their near climax state or their near old growth state. And if you could see the colors on this one, um, it's just, this is a, a fall image. Is there no way that can fix this? Yeah, is there a way that, that, I don't know if the projector has got something going on. Looks like the best photographer in the room. But that's all right. Um, but all is not lost, and there are still lots of areas you can go to to see some, some pretty neat stuff. Um, a couple of things to, to discuss. Um, if you're not familiar with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Texas Conservation Action Plan or the TCAP, um, this document identifies the Species of Greatest Conservation Need, or SGCN. And there are SGCN across taxa. So there's an, different animal SGCN, there's plant SGCN, but there's also plant community SGCN. And these are typically things that are rare, um, declining in need of conservation, um, but maybe are not protected by any sort of federal or state regulation. And I think TPWE is supposed to update this every five years, but um, I know that the, some of the trials and tribulations of working for a state agency, that can be hard to meet those deadlines sometimes. So I think they're currently working on a revision now, but it's, it's long overdue. 
but you can go, um, for example, if you go to the links that I've got on there, you can see what you can see the actual TCAP and you can see a list of SGCN. Um, so just kind of a, a broad overview of the types of communities that I'm going to be talking about today. These are, um, as I said, I'm kind of giving a high level view of the communities. You could really drill down within each of these communities and, and, and partition them out further. But for our purposes today, this is just a list of the things that I'm going to be talking about. And we'll start with your uplands. So these are communities that are typically on ridges or they're, they're set higher um, out of the floodplain and things like that. They're often drier um, based on their slope position, based on their soils, um, based on a variety of different factors, um, but you do have, you know, they're not all sandy. You can't have clay uplands, you can't have silty uplands, and things like that. And I'll show you a picture here in a little bit of an interesting type of upland. The first one I'll talk about are the xeric sandy lands, and you might see these called arid sandy lands, oak farkleberry sandy lands, xeric sand hills, um, things like that, grosserenic dry uplands. Um, One thing that I have on this slide that I'll be talking about quite a bit is the EMST. The EMST is the Ecological Mapping System of Texas. This is something that Texas Parks and Wildlife developed. It was an attempt to um, use remote data, so imagery and things like that, to create a digital layer of where different plant communities are in Texas. Now, in terms of the efficacy of that program at identifying properly where these communities are, especially in four cities, Texas, it's not great, but the actual community delineations that they have in there in the description of those communities is pretty useful in my opinion. So you can go into EMST documents and, for example, look up what is Piney Woods Sandhill Pine Woodland. Um, so these xeric sandy lands, um, they can occur in a couple of different situations. They can happen as you move a little bit into the central and northern Piney Woods. You have these deep Eocene sand formations like the Tonkawa sands, Sparta sands, um, different things there where you actually have formation-based sandy lands. As you go further south, we don't have those same formations, but what we have are areas where certain streams like Village Creek, for example, over millennia, millennia have deposited these large sand bank deposits. And if you're ever known to like Roy Larson Sandy Land, they've done studies there where the sand is like 70 to 90 feet deep in some areas. And that's all depositional sand from ship, Village Creek shifting and depositing that sediment. So these are some of the characteristic species that you'll find in these sandy lands. I'm also gonna have a couple images and talk a little bit about post oak savanna sandy lands. And you might hear these post oak sand blowouts, similar in terms of species composition um, to what we have here in the Piney Woods. And uh, there have been studies that show that these communities harbor the highest levels of endemism, of, of endemic plant species, things found nowhere else other than the West Gulf Coastal Plain and uh, all of the, the communities in the West Gulf Coastal Plain. So pretty neat places. Here's some images. Um, you can see here, there's, um, you have things like often reindeer moss there. Here's a little blue jack oak and longleaf pine and just really sparse open understories fire. Um, would have historically gone through here, but the fuel load here is much less just because trees tend to have, they struggle to grow in that deep sand, even though the precipitation is the same as it is in the bottomlands, it just percolates through that coarse soil really quickly. So there's not a lot of water availability. So you see things like cactus, yucca, other supplement plants there. Then we've got Penstemon murrianus, a really neat uh, West Gulf Coastal Plain endemic that's uh, you grow four or five feet tall, really pretty. Here's uh, Opuntia, it used to be Opuntia pumafusa, the eastern prickly pear, now it's CF cespitosa or something. They've done some, they've done some work to kind of recategorize the species, as they have a lot. And I work with all different taxa of plants and animals, and trust me, it's very hard to keep up with the changes. So it's an eastern prickly pear for all intents and purposes. Here's Lupinus perennis, the sundial lupine or the perennial lupine, really cool species. Um, we have just a couple of examples of where this can be found in Texas in the um, in the big thicket. Here's Phlox nivalis, uh, subspecies Texensis, Texas trailing phlox, federally endangered species. Um, 
that occurs in these deep sandy sandy lands, but it can also occur in long leaf pine savannas that maybe don't have that, the sand's not quite as deep. They'll be, you'll notice some of these aren't hard and fast. Some of these species kind of bleed over into other communities and things like that. But um, I often see these where there's really good deep sand. Here's an example of a post oak, um, a post oak savanna blowout, sand blowout. You said really deep sand. You have Opuntia. The the um, mint you see here is um, um, Brazoria truncata variety Pulcherima. It's a uh, it's a really neat, rare, endemic mint species found only in Texas. We have three species of Brazoria in Texas. Most of those are endemic. Really neat genus. Here's another post oak savanna blowout. This is a Bronia macrocarpa, another federally endangered species, large fruited sand verbena, really pretty species that grows in this deep sand. Here are some examples of different wildflowers you might find out there. Uh, Femoranthus rhodospermus, the, the famed flower. Delphinium carolinianum, they really like these communities and you see the blue variety, um, the, the piney kind of pine lind variety and um, but you'll find them in some other communities too, but they really like these deep sandy lands. Astragalus sapsmaniorum um, is the kind of light colored little fabacea up there, another West Gulf Coastal Plain endemic. And then lupin is subcarnosis, sandy land blue bonnet. Um, this is one, you know, whenever I see lupin is texensis in the piney woods, I just know that it's planted. It's not, it's not going to be here naturally. Lupin and subcarnosis is probably planted too, but sometimes you'll be in a remote stretch, you'll find a sandy land, it's got all the indicator species and you actually have lupin and subcarnosis there. So that I really do think that there are native um, populations of that species here in East Texas. There's Pensamin marianus again, um, really, really big, pretty Pensamin. This is Streptanthes, Hyacinthoides, another West Gulf Coastal Plain endemic. It's more common in the, in the post oak savanna, but there are a few piney wood sites where you can find that species. It's a really, really neat one. Streptanthus is a really cool genus, but it's a mustard family, Brassicacea. There's some cool species. Um, Phlox drumundii and, and prickly poppy. Then we have Tetragonotheca ludicusiana. That's yellow. You might not be able to tell here, but that's a, that's a bright yellow flower. Then we have some interesting milkweeds, Asclepius tomentosa, um, which this is another one that has that weird, it's got populations here and it's got populations in Florida. And I bet if someone were to really take a hard look, they could probably make a case for calling the ones we have here something different. And um, um, Metelius sarianchoides, this is a, a, one of those milkweed vines. Um, it's still a milkweed, you, can, you know, it's, 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 it's very closely related, but it's not Asclepius, it's a different genus. And then these are your post oak savanna, Brazoria truncata, variety Pulcherima, and Rhododon ciliatus, Texas endemic Rhododon ciliatus, really cool, deep purple mint. I'm going to the longleaf pine uplands. Um, you do have longleaf pine in these Eric Sandy Hills in the right situations. These longleaf pine uplands that we have, um, they're generally not as deep sand. And there's a whole gradient going from kind of more xeric to more mesic, so kind of more. Music is, I guess, moist. It's not super dry like xeric, and it's not super wet like hydric. It's kind of like just right, like Goldilocks and finding that, that perfect porridge. But um, you have different examples, and the species composition does vary a little bit as you go through there. And I'm not really going to make an effort to differentiate from that. Here's just some examples of sort of the physiognomy, the way that the forest looks as you as you approach it. They're generally really nice and open. Historically, these would have been maintained by periodic uh, growing season fires. So they would have had burns ignited by lightning and things like that on varying intervals. You know, I, I, if I were to guess, I would think that you might have some where you go an extended period of 10 years or more, and you might have some that are more frequent. It was probably just pretty random. It wasn't this perfect five-year cycle, I don't think, that people talk about. Um, but fire is a crucial component in maintaining these communities. And fire is not as important for the longleaf pine itself. Longleaf pine doesn't have serotonous cones. You know, serotonous cones are those cones that need those super high temperatures to open. We see that in a lot of Western pine species. Longleaf pine doesn't need that. What fire does for longleaf pine is maintains the communities that it likes. So it kind of, longleaf pine's really fire resistant, really hardy, 
they can stand up to it. But the other woody species that stop start puffing up there can't. So that fire helps eliminate that other wood encroachment. And what you get is a system, in my opinion, that's, that's really more prairie than it is forest. And so this is an example of, of really nice private land where the landowner can burn into the growing season and doesn't have all the same red tape that a lot of federal and state agencies have burning their land where they have to do it in the cool season. When you burn in the cool season, that is not what the historic, you know, we want to burn when it's wettest, coldest, and calmest. But that's not when fires occur naturally, right? <laughs> so what you have to do in those situations, you have to burn much more frequently. And sometimes you have to burn every year, every other year. The effects that doing that type of burn and a really intense growing season burn have on hardwood, you know, woody encroachment, things like that, it's night and day. They're completely different. So what we're seeing now in a lot of um, different areas is really uh, a community that's probably not that close to what it was historically. But when you get in these private lands, I really think where you have all this light, just picking the stag here, this prairie blazing star, you have all these other forbs under there. It's probably more what you would see than things like big carpets of bright and fern and things like that that you see uh, a lot in these areas. Just another example of some eupatorium and some Lytris pycnostachia, really pretty. These areas are just spectacularly beautiful. I'm just going to flip through some more images of kind of what they look like. <laughs> So here's some of the, the plants. This is um, um, Helianthus hirsutus and Lytris tenuous. Lytris tenuous is a really cool uh, what's called coastal plain endemic blazing star. Echinacea sanguinea, stylisma, um, kind of classic things, verbena carnea, polygola. Um, oh, geez, that one's escaping me. Well, it's a polygola, this, this really cool one that looks kind of like an elephant. Um, oh, geez, there's so many scientific names. This is Amorpha, what we're calling Amorpha Kinescens. You tend to see this more in the Great, you know, the Great Plains, Prairie communities and things like that. It is here in our Longleaf Pine Savannas. Um, I think there are folks that are questioning if this is the same entity that lives up in some of the more prairie areas. Um, Tephrosia onibrinchoides, that's this one here. And I do apologize. I do speak in Latin names. I can't. I, 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 that's how I learn things and memorize them. And I often forget the common names. So if you ever have any questions about these, come up to me, and I, I can try to see if we can figure out what it is. Common. Uh, Asclepias tuberosa, which is orange and not pink, <laughs> as this image would imply. Um, and then we have another milkweed, Asclepias obovata, the pineland milkweed that you find in these longleaf pine savannas. Um, that, you know, Asclepias tuberosa. Right, in lots of different communities, but you see them up pretty often in this long leaf pond stuff. Then another really pretty Asclepius, Amplexicolis, really big one, really tall milkweed. Um, then you have Scutellaria. Um, oh, one of the Scutellarias, Elliptica, I think that's Scutellaria. Did my mic blink out? Yeah. We'll get that going, but Scutellaria Elliptica, just a really pretty mint here. I'll just talk really loud. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. While well, they're working on that. Silene subciliata, scarlet catchfly. And then this is Alophia dramundii. Another one that's not really specific to longleaf pine savannas, but it does like those uplands. It's really pretty flower. It really, this one goes out into South Texas, more towards Central Texas. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Now, pine oak hickory uplands. This is just, to me, kind of a broad term that captures everything else that's in the upland. Um, if it's not long behind Savannah or Zurich Sand Hill in East Texas, you can probably fit it somewhere under this category. And again, you have uh, variation in soils, geology, and things like that. So another plug for some of the Van Clay's ordination stuff that you can really look and see some of the more fine level communities here. The illustrated flora of East Texas has a set in the, in the chapter there. It's really nice. Put out by Britt. It's good information there. Some of the characteristic species of those communities. Here's kind of what they look like. So that's the big 
uh, carry a thick sand, black and green, beautiful fall foliage. Um, <laughs> there's some Mexican plum. Um, so you get a lot of the pretty flowering plants, flowering dogwood. Um, you see these a lot in other places. You'll see these in the slopes as well, but to me, they're a little bit more common, kind of that more mesic upland situation. There's red bud, eastern red bud, more, more black hickory. And now you might be wondering, well, I see water in that image. Why is that in the upland thing? And this, this is a situation that's called a false bottomland. So for all intents and purposes, this species composition in these communities is a lot like what you find in the bottom line. You find willow oak here and things like that. But they occur in uplands. And they occur in situations where you have a clay pan that is super close to the surface. And so what happens is you get rains and things like that. The water is just super slow to penetrate the soil. And it leaves these standing, the standing water for a big chunk of the year. So it's not associated with any major waterway or anything like that. It's not in the floodplain. It's in an upland. But for all intents, it looks a lot like the bottom line. The species composition quite similar. Critagus opaca mayha, you find mayha in these situations a lot. It seems to me to be where I most often find them are in these false bottom lines. And then here, Carolina lily, um, lily and Uh These will occur in a variety of situations along the slope, you know, as you get down sort of to lower stream bottoms and things like that as well. But where I find them most frequently is kind of right at that upper end of the slope, where you kind of go from upland to slope. That transition zone, I really find Carolina lily to be most common in those situations. Some different, some different species: Viola pedata, birdfoot violet. Um, this is the two. I've been looking, I've been looking for years for this kind of two-tone variety. Most of the ones we have in East Texas are just sort of a light blue. But I found those finally a couple of years ago in San Augustine County. A really, really, really pretty violet. If you've never seen birth of violet, it's like five times the size of your average violet, which is such pretty things. Um, Asclepias variegata, white or red wing milk, red ring milkweed found in, in these uplands and down into the slopes as well. Spiranthes tuberosa, these tiny little lady tresses orchids, our smallest spiranthes species likes these situations. And then I've got Monarda um, brasiliana, which is a really cool Monarda that's in north, northeast Texas. So getting a little bit questionable as to whether or not we're in the piney woods or the post-oak savanna, you're right there in like Bowie, Red River County. You get a lot of influence from, from the Washington and things like that. And if you look on maps, it's kind of like all Blackland Prairie, post-oak savanna, piney woods, they all converge there. Lots of really cool species in northeast Texas. Next, we've got mesic transitional forests. So these are kind of like areas where you go from your upland and you start to slope down to the floodplain. And these areas historically would have been more protected from fire, both due to their slope position and uh, we're going to talk about beach, kind of beach dominated, American beach dominated forests. American beach actually has fire retardant leaves. So if you're ever walking through like a national forest where they did a burn and you see a beech tree, Look in the ground because oftentimes you'll see that, that there's a big area of unburned leaves around that beech trees because that fire really struggles to catch on those beech leaves. It's a really neat, it's a really neat species. I don't know if you can see here, but you have things. This is where you these are to me the prettiest. Some of our prettiest communities, if you get into a good example, especially in the spring or fall, you get fall colors that could rival most parts of the country in a good year. You get these displays of these spring ephemeral wildflowers like you see kind of out in. Appalachians or the eastern U.S. Here's some of the characteristic species um, in East Texas. Loblolly pine, I think kind of their historic preferred community would have been on these slopes, especially the lower terraces of these slopes, which is interesting because along the, the loblolly pine, like in central Texas, those disjunct populations, they like sand. But here in East Texas, really, you would find loblolly pine in these more mesic situations. Here are just some examples. So these are kind of our characteristic climax forests. You know, like longleaf pine savannas are not really, they're a disturbance climax community. They, they never reach a steady self-containing state. They require, they require an input of cyclical disturbance. But these communities left to their own devices theoretically will close out the canopy, come to a, a steady state. Maybe we're trying to get the, the color situation so. Oh! Yay. 
Thank you. There we go. Do it in fast forward. <laughs> okay, here we are. So your, your species composition in these hardwood dominated slopes can vary depending on where you are in that sort of um, well that, that latitudinal gradient in Texas. This is where you find things like southern lake slippers, cyclopedian Kentuckians. There's also a situation here that it's not really on the slope, but I, I've always called these mesic stream bottoms. They're small streams. They're not like big rivers. They're smaller streams and their floodplains don't get as wet as like the larger rivers. So in terms of species composition, they're much more like the slopes than they are like a bottomland. So I kind of incorporate those here as well. Here's a nice rocky outcrop in, I love this spot. It's in um, Cherokee County. And all of this is Rivies curvatum or granite gooseberry, just growing from these rocks. Such a cool plant, such a neat spot. Um, Pacara obobata, blooming in the slopes. That's um, um, cyanoglossum, I think. Cyanoglossum has changed up our aluminum something. But wild hound tug or wild comfrey, really pretty. It's got the big powdery leaves. Of course, may apples. Uh, Classic harbinger of spring, one of my favorite plants to see around here. Here's examples of what it can look like in the fall. You can just get really pretty colors on a good year. Some of the species here is Southern Lady Slipper, White Trout Lily, um, Erythronium albinum. There's different trilliums in Texas. We've got actually five species of trillium known in Texas. Most of them occur in these types of situations. Trillium. Um, Recurvatum and in a, in, a, in a friend's spot here in East Texas, we've got Trillium viridescens up in Northeast Texas. Trillium viridescens is a huge, massive trillium. Really, really cool. Some other rare ones, Anemian bitternatum, false ruin anemone, known from only a couple spots in Texas. We have uh, Uvularia sessilifolia, one of the bellworts. Viola pubescens, a, a yellow violet. Really cool, pretty rare in Texas. Um, Lathyrus venosus, this is a really pretty uh, bean that you find growing in these real nice music hardwood forests. Um, Monotropa, uniflora, or the ghost pipes or Indian pipes, cool species. And then this one's a bit of a stretch in terms of piney woods, although there are some Northeast Texas populations. Uh, Calencia violacea, violet blue eyed Mary, which is an awesome species. A lot of people don't realize it occurs in Texas. Super, super pretty. And it's an annual in good years in the right spot. It can bloom in by the thousands. And then Solomon Seal, just a really cool plant. So it's got its own slide. <laughs> um, sort of a subset of these communities I think is worth mentioning, especially because where we're at. I'm guessing that some folks might see this today are these American beach dominated slopes. So American beach, Vegas Grandifolia is uh, a really neat species. It reaches the western edge of its range here in East Texas. And you don't find it throughout all of the pine woods. Kind of, you know, as you get north from like Shelby, Nacogdoches County, it kind of falls out. And you don't really see it. There are a couple of like disjunct populations up near Kettle Lake, stuff like that, but it kind of loses. it. So it's really only in this sort of smaller subset of the, the pine woods, but it's super cool. And kind of down big thicket area, you often find it uh, growing like with southern magnolia as a co-dominant species. And those are what you hear beach magnolia forests. Um, you probably hear that a lot in like, looking at big thicket plant communities and things like that. On the more calcareous or the more basic soil sites, especially as you start going further north, they really seem to be co-dominant with white oak, uh, Quercus alba, and just really cool places to be. Some of the kind of characteristic species you find here, and here's just some examples of, of what it can look like. Beach, really easy to recognize that tree even in winter by the bark. There's, there's beach on a nice bluff over the Natchez River. 
this nice little stream bottom here. And, and often beach occurs on the super steep slope, slope that you can barely walk up. And there are those examples of that here in East Texas. But super pretty. And they're really fun to photograph in those rare situations where we get a little bit of snow. <laughs> So here's some examples. These are species that more often than not, at least in my experience, are associated with American beech forests over other hardwood forests, other hardwood slope forests. So you see things like Erythronium rostratum, yellow trout lilies, Spigelia marylandica, uh, Indian pink, cardamine concatenata, uh, toothwort, phlox de vericata, super cool, super pretty phlox. Um, another peripheral, and I usually see those associated with beech. Tiny little orchid. Um, I learned it as Listeria australis, but in, in the audio by Flora or something like that. It's like they're calling it now. Trillium gracile. Um, this is one of our trillium species that I typically find in these situations. Sanguinaria canadensis bloodroot, one of our coolest native wildflowers, in my opinion. Another bellwort, Uvularia, uh, Uvularia perfoliata. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, sometimes with all these names. Another one that I really like, Utesia veritiflora. Um, this is just a really neat summer. It's one of the few plants that actually blooms in the summer. So like June, you can go out and find these really pretty plants blooming in these beach woods. So as you move down to the to down the slope, especially towards our largest waterways, like the Natchez River, the Angelina River, the Sabine River, um, you get into the floodplain of those, and then you start seeing a different forested community. Um, and some of what you can see there are like the classic bottomland hardwood forests or the oak dominated bottomlands. Um, these are often like overcup oak, willow oak, our classics here. You see water hickory mixed in, Carolina ash, um, but you see sweet gum. Sweet gum's everywhere, right? But I've seen some really nice sweet gum in these bottomlands, really big, big sweet gum that are really pretty. So here's kind of what it looks like. There you have over a boat here, and there's one of those massive, big, big sweet gums down in the bottom then. Um, Pacara uh, labella, butterweed likes to bloom in these areas in the spring. You can find huge groups of it. Here's an example with a bunch of um, inland sea oats kind of in their winter state. And here's, this is on the Natchez River, and this is just showing you kind of how the situation occurs. So you can see you have this kind of gradual slope from the Natchez River into this bottomland. And as that, the river, Natchez River floods, which we all know that these rivers in East Texas, they flood. They'll pour water into there for days um, at a time, or longer sometimes, sometimes for almost an entire season if it's wet. Some examples of plants you can see here are things like cardinal flower, um, Ansonia. Ansonia repens is probably mostly what we have here in the southern part. Ansonia Tabernay Montana, kind of as you move to further east Texas. Lizard tail and button bush, classic bottomland plants. Iris brevicollis, a really pretty spring plant down there. And then sometimes you get these really cool, this is Utricularia flata. There's a number of different Utricularia species, carnivorous plants that float on the water and they have these big, there's two species we have that have these floating, they're like ballast, they're these big leaves that are inflated, they keep the plant afloat, and they're filled with these little um, fibers that have these tiny little triggers, like these little air-filled sacs and triggers that dangle in the water and it's like tiny aquatic organisms swim past them, they'll hit that trigger, that little sac will open, and then as the air in the sac is placed, it pulls that little critter in there, and gives them a little meal. <laughs> Asclepias perennis, aquatic milkweed. Wisteria frutescens. This is our native wisteria. Not very, not very easy to see this one around anymore, but I typically see them kind of on the edges of these bottomlands, um, growing often in buttonwood thickets or things like that. Uh, super, super pretty species. And then, forgive my lack of a better term, but we got swamps. Um, you'll hear this like a uh, Cypress tubular swamp, cypress tubular slough, ball cypress swamp, things like that. Um, but these are areas that often have water, whole water for a good chunk of the year. Cypress tends to be your dominant species, but you can have things like water tubular mixed in there and some of the other characters that we've uh, talked about in the oak dominated bottomlands. 
Flagner tree, Thonera aquatica, really cool water elm. You might hear it called water elm. Really neat tree that's got a bunch of gnarly trunks coming up. So here's kind of what some of that looks like. Um, there's all ball, but, buttress style ball cypress, ball cypress and water too below in the big thicket. There's a planter tree right there. You see just really, to me, really cool, neat looking trees. That's possible in the Yellow Island. I don't know if you guys have had if, you, if you're driving to Bowden Lake from 69, you'll pass this exact spot. In the fall, those bike ball cypress are really pretty. And then, of course, there's Cata Lake, the epitome of a swamp, I suppose, in Texas. The speed, I don't have a lot of species for these swamps. Um, there's not a whole lot that are really characteristic. But this one, Sebacea calicina, is super cool. It's one of our Sebacea. That's like our, uh, we, you might hear a meadow pink or a Jabros gentian or something like that. Super cool species. There's a number of really rare peripheral, peripheral sebacea that occur in Texas, and this is one of them, sebacea calicina, which I find southeast Texas growing in the edges here. Spiranthes odorata. This is a huge Spiranthes, um, not like that tiny tuberosa, and it's called odorata because it smells fantastic. <laughs> And then you have forested communities that occur on like stream banks, sand stream banks or parent areas. That's dominated by species like eastern cottonwood, sycamore, box elder, river birch, willow. These species that can take hold on those banks, grow quickly, and they can establish themselves. And then your, your herbaceous community tends to just be early succession stuff in those, in those situations because of the high velocity flows that come through with floods just scour everything out of the way. This is, this is a little bit like what those systems look like. You get if you're ever like walking up on a high bank of a of a larger stream, this is often what you'll see. Or even like kind of as a sandbar, as a point sandbar, something like that, it starts meeting you know, forested areas. So the last forested community I want to talk about are forested seats. And this is the one that you probably hear called bagels. Um, bagels are really only a thing in Southeast Texas, it's named for two dominant species, Sweet Bay Magnolia, which is a big tree, and uh, Gallberry Holly, Ilus Coriacea, which is a bit shrubby holly. You find those growing together in the big thicket, but we have these forested seeps way up in Northeast Texas too, and that Gallberry Holly falls out. This is, uh, these situations can occur where like, you have herbaceous systems where fire is being excluded, and it starts getting wood encroachment, and so those seepy herbaceous situations turn into these bagels, into these forest seeps over time. Those aren't as exciting to me as if you find like a good, mature forested seep that was probably always a forested seep. And where those occur are especially where you have xeric sand hills or other real steep sandy areas, where that steep sandy hill has a clay pan that's running almost perpendicular to the angle of the hill. And as water filters through that sand, it hits that pan and it trickles down slowly underground until it emerges at this point. Oftentimes there's a buffer. So oftentimes you'll have that sandy upland and then you'll have a beach forest or you'll have a hardwood forest that buffers fire so it doesn't reach that kind of forest to seep area. So fire has been excluded a long time and it grows up and it's really cool. Red maple grows here a lot. Red maple is pretty plastic. You find it in a lot of communities, but I often find it here. Um, you find swamp too below. Texas or swamp azalea, whatever you want to call that. Some call it uh, rhododendron of longifolium. Some call it rhododendron, the widespread rhododendron viscosum. There's a lot of cool stuff. Lots of ferns, different varieties. So this is kind of what these systems look like. Oftentimes there's a lot of sphagnum moss, spongy ground, lots of water. Um, this is, um, Jeez, I'm having a, uh, a moment here. Remember this one, but it's such a cool plant. It's a uh, Melianthemum virginicum. And I can't remember the, the common name on that one, but it's like seven, they grow like seven feet tall, huge flowers, really pretty. Um, pretty much all parts of that plant are toxic. It's so pretty. Here's that rhododendron along the folium or viscosum. Sweet bay, magnolia. Just a big look at that, all the ferns, things like that. Cinnamon fern, beautiful fall color. A cinnamon fern takes on really nice colors in good fall. You often see these situations too where you have like a braided stream. You have really acidic soil. That they, the acidity of the soil is really, they're really highly acidic. 
some examples. Maybe some folks might get lucky and see uh, Gentiana saponaria today, grows in there. Um, Trillium texanum, really pretty species. Really cool orchids, uh, Isotria versalata, the world pagonia grows kind of on the edge. Um, Lotanthra clavulata, that's where I find these most often. Bermania by flora, and um, these are kind of these interesting little non photosynthesized they do photosynthesize some of them, but like, like um, Apteria phila here, um, Nodding Nixie, it's one of those kind of uh, micro heterotrophic species that doesn't photosynthesize and bleeds its energies from those mycorrhizal fungi. Parnassia, um, Sarfolia, Amorpha pediculata. Now other communities, and I don't see, well, how are we doing on time? You, Matt, you have about, we're, since you started late and we're not doing anything but the field trips, we decided to let you go for another 10 minutes. It's perfect. okay with everybody. Is that all right? I think, I think that should be able to wrap it up. Okay, perfect. So I'm moving now into some more historically non-forested communities in East Texas, and those do exist. Um, Piney Woods is a bit of a misnomer. It's not all piney, it's not all woods. There were these treeless communities. Um, these were maintained by a variety of factors. Some of them are related to the soil. Some of them are related to periodic disturbance like fire, grazing by American bison, um, which would have historically come through East Texas, at least in some portion of their annual cycle. Um, so there's lots of cool stuff. Barrens and glades. Um, in East Texas, the most common ones you hear about are catahoula barrens. These are barrens where the catahoula formation is very close to the surface. There's a very thin layer of kind of coarser soils over that. Um, some of these outcrops and barrens of the catahoula formation can be high in aluminum content, which is toxic to a lot of plants, so it kind of limits some of the plants that can grow there. Then you have weeches glades. Um, those are on the, where the, the weeches formation comes to the surface. There's outcrops, rocky outcrops, very high in glauconite. Um, one of the reasons there's so few weeches glades now is because they have all that glauconite. They establish these glauconite mines and people like to use glauconite in road basin, things like that. It's a good substitute for lime. It's super, super calcareous, really calcium rich. So in Catahoula Barrens, you do have trees sometimes, um, but they're often really widely spaced and they're super stunted. There are old growth examples of like longleaf pine, and blue jack oak in these systems that might be a couple hundred years old and no more than like six to eight inches in diameter, maybe 30 feet tall. They're just super stunted because they just struggle to grow there, but they're so hardy that they can hang on. Weeches glades, super cool. They're in these really small, kind of isolated areas, and you have a lot of endemic species, including two federally listed species, Texas Golden Glade Crest and White Bladder Pod, which I'll show you some images of here in a moment. So here's what Catahoula Barrens look like. You can see there's a lot of exposed ground, exposed soil, um, sparsely vegetated in some areas, uh, Liatris mucronata or, or Liatris, um, I can't remember what it was now before that, but. Here's an example of just this area where you don't have a lot of vegetation growth. I call these, I call these systems vernally hydric. Um, it's kind of, I don't know if that's really an official term or anything, but I call it that because during the spring, when there's a lot more moisture and there's not as much um, demand you know, from plant species for that water, the water table rises, a lot of times these areas will be wet. There'll be little standing pools, puddles, and there'll be plant species adapted to those little pools and puddles. Um, but as summer goes on and we get less rain and those tree roots are sucking all the water up, they become dry. It's like crunchy to walk on. So it's just a really neat situation that has, has some pretty cool adaptive plant species. More like just uh, Granada. And it's not always super barren. There are a number of grass species and forbs that can grow there. Um, so sometimes it can look really pretty at the right time of year. Some examples here, um, Macranthes, Texana, our little Texas saxifra saxifrage, Schoenelirian ridei, uh, one of the Sunnyvale, I don't know, Rice Sunnyvale maybe, it's really cool. One of those that grows in those vernally hydric wet areas in the spring. 
Gradiola, Flava, another West Coast Coastal Plain endemic. And then a lot of the plants here are almost like microflora. They're really small. Like this is Ketopapa uh, asteroides. It's a little least daisy. It looks like a daisy, except it's like minuscule, minuscule. And then we just guys, I apologize. I don't have any good like overall images of the, the landscape, but we just guys, just because they're so small, most are in private land that are hard to get access to. And they're not, some of them are like in the middle of cattle pastures and stuff like that. So they're not particularly photogenic, but there's a lot of cool plants like this um, Arkansas mean super fragrant, Cenum Bocellum, Widow's Cross, super cool uh, succulent species. This is that 11 Worthia Texana, Texas Golden Glade Crest, only known to occur naturally in Sabina and San Augustine counties in Texas. And our white bladder pot is only known from Sabine County. One county in all of Texas where this thing grows. <laughs> um, this is Stryptanthes maculatus, maculatus. Awesome, awesome, beautiful plant. It's the type species for Stryptanthes. Um, they're really cool. So these grow in kind of East Texas over Weeches Glades, but then they also start to get picked up and over formations with similar substrate like in Arkansas, Oklahoma. Thank you, sir. Prairie inclusions. So these are natural prairies um, in, in kind of deep east Texas. These are often over the flare Fleming Formation. So a lot of those Fleming prairies um, you'll hear about, maybe you've heard that term before. But in northeast Texas, there's some awesome examples. We call them Sylvia Stropsy prairies, um, technically more blackland than piney woods. And these are kind of occurring in Bowie County, Red River, Lamar County. So Questionable if you follow the map of Piney Woods communities, but really there's a lot of similarities. So here's just kind of an example of one with that teaches for a carpa, super pretty. And I have a lot of flowers on this one because this is a really good area to go through wildflowers. So I'll burn through them. Marshallia, sesquitos, a couple of neat beans, Astragalus anglomanii, and uh, Dahlia candida, Eustoma, beautiful Eustoma, Asclepias ruriflora. Things that are more typical further west that creep into these little prairie inclusions. Um, Physostegia, um, geez, um, Angustifolia, and Brazoria, or Nokia, this little prairie Brazoria, a couple of populations here in East Texas. Going on to the last communities, these are herbaceous seeds and wet in the pine savannas. And herbaceous seeds grow where you have a hillside and a longleaf pine savanna typically. Um, Steep hillside, similar situation. You have an intersecting clay pan. Water goes through the sand, hits the clay pan, and just seeps out of the side of the hill. Fire would have kept these areas open because they're in the middle of long pine savannas that would have historically burned. Then you have wetland pine savannas, areas that are flat woods. These are more typical sort of big thicket area. And these would have been drier in the summer and they would have burned periodically during that time. Some characteristic species that you can find there. Here's some examples of what herbaceous seeds look like. It's kind of all of a sudden you hit all these carnivorous plants and orchids. Species adapted to harsh soil conditions because that water percolates out the side, it's really leaching a lot of the nutrients. So these sort of favor species like carnivorous plants and orchids that are adapted to obtain nutrients by other means. Another good example, you can see a steep hillside with a lot of Saracenia lata. Uh, well, in pine savanna, similar species composition between these two. There are a few different species that maybe prefer one type over the other, but you see a lot of the same species. Here's an example in winter of a wetland pine savanna. Here's Cheptalia, Cheptalia tomentosa, in a wetland pine savanna. Rubecchia scabrifolia, really pretty endemic Rubecchia species, super tall. Calipogon uh, tuberosa, two other orchids. Platanthra chapmanii, this is uh, a really neat, rare orchid in, in Platanthra nivea, uh, also rare. I think Platanthra, the, the genus may have changed, or for nivea, the genus may have changed from Platanthra. One more orchid um, that I think is really cool because it looks like a spinal column. This is uh, <laughs> Spiranthes longulabris, really pretty rare in Texas. Lysostegia longicephala, really cool west Gulf coastal plain endemic, only really in East Texas, West Louisiana. A couple of cool milkweeds, Asclepias rubra and Asclepias lanceolata, the coastal plain species. Polygola nana, or candy root, really cool, and uh, Sebacea gentianoides. A couple more examples here. Um, 
or Bexamon simplex is that little Fabacea there, snake root, really cool, and then the carnivorous um, Inguicula pomilla, and then that's it.